Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitchell McConnell is threatening to keep Senate in session until he breaks the Democratic Party opposition to moving ahead with the approval of the Keystone XL pipeline. He expects to get the 67 votes he needs to make the Keystone XL legislation veto-proof by President Obama. In the meantime, a new study funded by the UK Energy Research Center and published in the Journal of Nature makes it clear that globally a third of oil reserves, half of the gas reserves, and over 80% of the current coal reserves must remain in the ground if we are to stay below the targeted 2 degrees Celsius identified by the IPCC to limit catastrophic climate change. Now joining us from London, England, to discuss this study is one of its lead authors, Paul Eakins. Eakins is Professor of Resources and Environmental Policy and Director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources at the University College London. He's also Deputy Director of the UK Energy Research Centre. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. That's my pleasure. Professor Eakins, what are the findings of your study? Well, uh, very much as you've described it, we were using a model which for the first time is able to distinguish between the oil, gas and coal reserves um, globally uh, and is also able to locate those reserves. And the model then chooses the most cost effective reserves to exploit, um, obviously to satisfy our energy demands through to 2050. Uh, that is consistent with uh, carbon emissions not uh, exceeding uh, what would be required to stay within the two degrees centigrade guardrail, which policymakers globally have decided uh, marks the threshold of dangerous anthropogenic climate change. Professor Eakins, was the IPCC aware of your study and the conclusions you draw because you seem to back their findings and recommendations? No, it didn't because it's been carried out since the IPCC published its fifth assessment report. Uh, in fact, it drew very heavily on that report, both in terms of the carbon budget that we used in order to identify how much carbon emissions could be emitted in order to stay within the two degree centigrade guardrail, um, but also to identify uh, where those uh, carbon resources were going to be located. Now, these are very important findings if we are to get a grip on climate change. Uh, here in the United States, the Senate is now on the verge of approving the Keystone XL pipeline between Canada and the US uh, to ship shale oil. The bill was once defeated, but with the Republicans controlling the Senate now, it is back on the floor. Any advice for them? Well, um, academics make uh, policymakers aware as far as they can by publishing in the scientific literature. And obviously, Nature is a well-respected journal. You're quite right in saying that this is an immensely important decision. Uh, huge investments uh, would be made in the XL pipeline uh, if it were to go ahead. And on the basis of our study, it seems very likely that a large part of the Canadian oil or tar sands reserves uh, would need to stay in the ground if we are to meet our climate change targets. And that means that a lot of that investment in the pipeline would effectively be wasted. Um, it would become what is coming to be known as a stranded asset, something which had cost a lot of money to create, but because we couldn't afford to pump the oil from Canada down into the US, uh, it would remain unused. And I think, therefore, the people who think they might invest in this pipeline uh, need to think twice. Right. And is it not uh, even less attractive now to build such infrastructure uh, because shale is so expensive in the first place to take out of the ground and the oil prices have fallen so dramatically in, in the recent months? Um, is it not cost efficient anyway? 
Well, um, that's another very important point. Um, the fall in the oil price uh, came after our study. Uh, we did do some sensitivity uh, analysis around oil prices. And what that means is that we ran some scenarios with higher oil prices than those um, that were uh, in the model to start with and with lower oil prices. And exactly as you're saying, uh, what happens if the oil price falls is that the more expensive oil resources become uneconomic. Um, and in our model, that meant uh, particularly Arctic resources, uh, many of which, of course, uh, have not yet been formally discovered, and that's why they're resources and not reserves. Um, but also some of the Canadian oil sand uh, reserves, they are relatively expensive uh, oil, uh, oil reserves. And with the oil price at its current level, it's very unlikely that new investment in those oil sands is likely to pay off. And Paul, in Europe itself, the South Stream pipeline has been cancelled uh, by the Rus Russians, um, and, uh, and that's obviously a positive move. Uh, but uh, w what kind of um, hearing are you getting in terms of your findings in Europe? Well, there's, I would say, increased interest in Europe, um, both because uh, the European Union is taking the climate change issue more seriously, certainly than the US Congress, uh, though not necessarily more seriously than the US president. Um, and they're therefore uh, more open to messages about the need to keep uh, resources in the ground. Uh, obviously, the Russian situation is very complicated by geopolitical issues. The fact that uh, large parts of Eastern Europe are still very dependent on Russian gas and uh, looking for alternative supplies, but that's also making uh, the whole issue to do with renewables, um, wind resources and solar resources, uh, which are obviously in, in good supply in many parts of Europe. It's making them much more uh, attractive, even though at the moment they're rather more expensive than fossil fuels, because uh, at least there's no one who can turn the tap off. Right. And then in London, uh, Paul, I mean, this study is actually uh, funded by the UK government um, and, uh, and your centre has put a lot of energy into coming up with this timely report. Is there a hearing there in terms of the UK energy policy? Yes, there's a lot of interest here. Um, I mean, the study is funded by the UK research councils who are indeed funded by the UK government, but very much at arm's length. The government has no influence over the kind of research that is funded. Um, and uh, as you may know, there has been a lot of interest recently in the prospects for UK shale gas, uh, very much uh, in the hope that uh, in the UK we can have some of the success that you've had in the United States uh, with shale oil and shale gas. Uh, at the moment, uh, we haven't really got any uh, resources that have been proved to be economically viable. And the question is whether we go ahead and uh, explore for those and uh, see if they can be proved to be economically viable. Uh, there's been a lot of very unwarranted hyperbole about this on this side of the Atlantic. Um, uh, people seeming to assume that just because it's happened in the US, it must automatically happen in the UK, despite geological differences, despite socioeconomic differences. Um, and what our study says is that if indeed we do find economically viable shale resources uh, in the UK, then uh, some other uh, oil and gas resources elsewhere in the world will have to remain unburnt because the carbon budget is a cap. And if we produce uh, resources from here that uh, were, were not expected to be produced by the model, and indeed the model doesn't produce them, then we're going to have to leave other resources somewhere else unburned. Right. And, and uh, these findings will have uh, enormous impact if, if implemented and, and uh, you have your hearing, will have enormous impact on countries that depend on oil for their livelihood, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Venezuela, um, and many others, uh, Russia included. Um, what is, in your, is there anything in your study that addresses these issues? Uh, the brief answer to that is no. We don't look at the geopolitical considerations. 
Uh, our concern in doing the study was to make sure that policy negotiators are aware of the fact that the resources uh, will need to be uh, not burned and that that will obviously have to be factored in to the climate change negotiations that are taking place each year and the most important ones taking place in Paris towards the end of this year. Um, that's a very important consideration because the countries that you've mentioned will come to those climate change negotiations uh, in the awareness that uh, a strong agreement will mean that they won't be able to exploit their resources. And that will have to be taken into account in any agreement that is reached. Paul, I'm wondering if you actually came up uh, with some solutions in your study to carbon emissions, like the proposal for carbon capture. Uh, well, yes, we did. We ran a scenario specifically uh, with carbon capture and storage options uh, and one without those options. Uh, and rather surprisingly, um, it turned out that the availability of carbon capture and storage did not make much difference to the quantity of fossil fuels that could be burnt before 2050. And people were surprised about that, including ourselves. And uh, we asked, why was this the case? And there are really two big reasons why this happened. Uh, the first is that carbon capture and storage is not yet a commercially proven technology. And so we didn't think it was realistic to allow the model to take it up at scale uh, until 2025, which is obviously um, part of the way to 2050 already. Uh, and then carbon capture and storage is uh, a pretty capital intensive technology. It's pretty expensive. Um, and it's unrealistic to expect that we could simply build it um, uh, enormous quantities of it all over the world immediately, uh, industries would have to gear up and they'd have to acquire experience. So we limited the construction rate of carbon capture and storage uh, out until 2050. Um, and it's an immensely important technology after 2050, but before 2050, uh, it doesn't make that much difference to the amount of fossil fuel that can be burned. Um, only, for example, an extra 6% of coal reserves uh, were burnt in our technology that allowed carbon capture and storage. Um, uh, after 2050, as I say, it's a different story. It's especially important then for burning uh, biomass um, and sequestering the carbon from that, and that gives you effectively negative emissions. But uh, our study wasn't looking beyond 2050. Right. Paul, I know that the agreement that was signed between China and the United States to reduce emission um, took into consideration the uh, technology or made reference to the technology of carbon capture and storage. Now, you're saying this is essentially unfeasible at the, uh, at the moment. Well, it's, uh, it's not commercially proven at the moment. Uh, and the uh, biggest plants that have been made operational, there was one in Canada, uh, came on stream reasonably recently, uh, turned out to be very expensive indeed, more expensive than people have thought, which, which again is not surprising for a new technology. But that means that I think our assumption that it's not going to be widely available before 2025 is a pretty realistic assumption. And I think too that our constraints on the growth rate of it thereafter are also pretty realistic. That's not to say that it can't play a major role uh, further out into the future, beyond 2050. Uh, and I think it's um, certainly advisable that we develop it um, as fast as we can. And so I welcome the US-China agreement, but I don't think it's going to provide a get out of jail free card for burning fossil fuels between now and 2050. Okay. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. My, my great pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.